Ivana Damjanovic and with my colleague Nicola de Sadeler, we will delve into the links between trade and sustainable development and provide different perspectives on the European Union's trade and sustainability agenda. Today we have the pleasure to interview Mr. Ignacio Garcia Bercero, who is director in the Director General for Trade of the European Commission, the executive of the European Union. In recent times, we have seen major turn oil in the global economy due to a range of factors, such as the Russian invasion of Ukraine, fragmentation of supply chains, US-China trade wars, and so on. More generally, we could talk about the clash between autocracies and liberal democracies. What is the impact of these events on EU trade policy? Could we say that we are seeing a new world order in the making? Yeah. Well, I think I'm very glad that you're asking that question because even before the, we had uh, the war of aggression to, on Ukraine, the European Union had been reflecting about how its trade policy should be adapted to a new global situation characterized by geopolitical conflicts and major economic transformations. And that's the reason why in February of 2021, that is to say way beyond uh, the invasion of Ukraine, we already came forward with a new trade policy approach where we put the emphasis on the need to combine the openness with a strong commitment to sustainability, but also with assertiveness, because we need to be able to define the, our interests when we are actually facing the, a very turbulent uh, world. So yes, I think it is clear that all those elements have had uh, an impact on European Union trade policy. They have had an impact on all policies in the European uh, Union. But what I would like to emphasize is that they have in no way retracted uh, towards our commitment to openness and towards our commitment towards multilateralism. So I would like to come back to that issue as we continue this conversation. The two buzzwords of the European Commission are geopolitics on the one hand and strategic autonomy. Strictly speaking, these concepts relate to national defense and security. How can one implement this concept into the trade policy? No, absolutely. And I have to say that one of the issues that was very important uh, as we began to discuss those concepts in the context of economic policies and in the context of uh, trade policies is to emphasize the element of openness. That's why you will have noticed that whenever we talk about the strategic autonomy in a trade policy context, we always talk about open uh, strategic autonomy. But it is clear that in a turbulent world, uh, we need to be able to have a capacity to react, to defend our autonomous choices. But at the same time, we want to do it as much as possible in partnership with our partners and uh, without retracting to our commitment to the rule-based trading order. And I would say that geopolitics is just simply a reality. It's not that we have chosen to be geopolitic, geopolitically, that you cannot actually act in the current global environment without being very conscious about uh, the overall geopolitical situation. In 2019, the European Commission has been launching a major legislative reform known as the European Green Deals. The objectives are extremely ambitious. Is it possible to implement, to flesh out this objective into the trade policy? I think it's very clear, and I don't think it's only for the European Union. The biggest challenge that we are currently facing is the challenge uh, posed by climate change. And therefore, the need uh, to move towards a net zero economy, it is a fundamental economic choice uh, for Europe, which has an impact on all European Union uh, policies, including, of course, European Union uh, trade uh, policy. Now, another element that was very important uh, in this new trade policy strategy that we adopted uh, in the February of 2021 was to put sustainability very much at the center of our trade policy. That's why we said that the trade policy that we want to develop is characterized by openness, sustainability, and assertiveness. So sustainability is not just an adjunct to trade policy. It is something that is very much at the center of what we want to do when we negotiate bilateral agreements, when we promote uh, uh, certain activities in the context of the WTO. And of course, it is also reflected on some of our autonomous instruments, which are responding to our ambitions to achieve a sustainable 
a European economy and to be able to achieve net zero. The European Union had ambitious trade policies in the past. What would you say are the key differences of the 2021 policy in comparison to the previous ones? Well, I would say that uh, fundamentally if you compare this with some previous trade policy communications, you will see that there is not a big change in terms of the commitment uh, towards uh, openness, both in terms of support for the WTO and in the terms of support for an active bilateral trade policy agenda. That's very much something which is in common between the most recent uh, trade policy strategy and previous uh, ones. What is probably more new is the strongest emphasis on sustainability, putting this back much more at the center of all our trade policy engagement, and also the recognition that if the European Union is to be in a position to defend uh, its interests, we need to have the necessary tools to be able to defend those is their interest in an assertive manner. And that's also why over this period of time, there have been a significant amount of legi legislative activity to complete uh, our toolbox, where it is on the field of investment screening, where it is on the field of export uh, controls, where it is uh, on the field of promoting a level playing field uh, on procurement, uh, on foreign subsidies, and also on the sustainability front through legislation such as the carbon border adjustment measure or the due diligence legislation. the number of measures that the EU is introducing in order to incorporate sustainability into trade. Looking more specifically at the bilateral level, since the first agreement with South Korea in 2011, the EU has been introducing trade and sustainable development chapters. What would you say are the core objectives of these chapters? Is it to level the playing field or is it to use trade as an instrument for achieving sustainability in third countries? No, I think you are quite right to say, as I was actually responsible for negotiating our free trade agreement uh, with Korea and it's the first time that we included uh, a trade and sustainable development chapter in our uh, trade agreements. And from the very beginning, uh, we wanted to be very clear that when it comes to trade and sustainable development, we want to anchor to what we do in our bilateral engagement on course multilaterally agreed principles. That's why we have always given a lot of importance to the fundamental ILO conventions for the labor part and uh, to the multilateral environmental agreements for the environmental part. And that's what, if you want me to characterize the fundamental objective that we are pursuing, it is not a level playing field objective. That's not the fundamental objective that we pursue through the trade and sustainable development chapters. It is much more to ensure that both sides to a privileged uh, trade relationship have a common commitment to the effective implementation of these court uh, uh, values, which are multilateral values. It's not the European Union trying to promote uh, its own values, but they are multilateral values reflected on multilateral or multilateral conventions. Some critics uh, emphasize that these uh, international commitments are rather minimal. Uh, the conventions listed in the, these bilateral treaties have uh, often been adopted in the 70s, 80s. Um, is, is this sufficient to cope with the uh, global environmental crisis or the uh, climate crisis? Well, I think it is very important that we actually put at the core of our uh, engagement what has been recognized by the international community as being the common values. There has been a lot of work in the context of the ILO to identify which conventions are fundamental ILO conventions. And by the way, when the ILO has decided that a new convention should also be considered to be fundamental, we try to incorporate that into our most recent agreements. And the same thing when it comes uh, to actually um, the environmental engagement, I don't think that it would make a lot of sense for the European Union to try to promote a policy which is not consistent with the multilateral agreement that we have concluded, like the Paris Agreement or the Biodiversity 
a convention. So that's why we think it's very important for the legitimacy of what we are doing, for the effectiveness to anchor it uh, very much on these multilateral engagements. But of course, what we always emphasize is the need for an effective implementation of those agreements and the need uh, to use also the bilateral dialogue to reinforce the commitment uh, from both sides to the implementation of those multilateral uh, or those multilateral agreements. In order to strengthen trade and sustainable development chapters, the Commission has in adopted a new approach in 2022 and this approach has already been implemented in the agreement with New Zealand. Could you tell us what are the key novelties and what are some of the measures that are available in case of breaches of core obligations? I think that uh, this communication to a large extent it is based on the continuation of this policy which is fundamentally based on partnership, on engagement and multilateral trade commitments, but it also tries to address some of the criticism that has been made uh, of that policy in the past uh, and as a consequence of the dialogue that we have had with the European Parliament, uh, with member states and with civil society. I would say that the three main uh, elements which are new is first of all uh, the integration into our bilateral agreements uh, of the question of how our bilateral agreements can assist in the, imp in the implementation of our autonomous uh, sustainable related measures. So I think that's something which obviously has a key importance on our relationship with uh, third countries. So there are many questions that have been raised about uh, our new deforestation legislation, about uh, the carbon border adjustment measure, and we also want to use our bilateral agreements as instruments to, uh, for engagement and to see how to facilitate and support the uh, implementation of those, uh, of those measures. A second element, I would say, is to try to be much more granular in terms of identifying with a particular country which are the key trade-related sustainability challenges so that we just don't follow just an automatic template approach and we pretend that New Zealand and Chile is the same situation. You really try to identify country by country which are the trade-related sustainability concerns which are more important and then you see how you can try also to address those in the context of your negotiations with the country, with the country concerned. And of course, the one which has attracted probably more attention because it's very visible is for the first time the indication that under certain uh, very specific circumstances, trade sanctions can be applied as a measure of last resort. I mean, to clarify, our uh, trade and sustainable development chapters have always been legally binding, have always been subject to a bilateral dispute settlement mechanism, which by the way we have used in the past. We actually launched a case against Korea because they were not respecting mm -hmm. some of the commitments that had been included uh, in the RTSD chapter, which by the way had, uh, I think, a very satisfactory outcome, that dispute settlement case. But until now, our uh, policy has been that in order to comply with those rulings, we would continue to privilege almost exclusively a policy of dialogue and a policy of engagement. But uh, obviously that raises the question, what happens uh, if in a particular serious case, uh, a country simply decides to ignore the recommendations coming for a bilateral uh, dispute settlement ruling? And we saw that in those uh, circumstances of last resort, the possibility of having to a sanction available is something that should be provided for. And as you have quite rightly said, uh, I think the first time when we have actually implemented these policies in our recent agreement with New Zealand. You've just been stressing that the sustainable development chapters refer to a number of agreements with respect to human rights on the one hand and environmental protection on the other hand. Many critics are taking the view that the obligation encapsulated in these agreements are rather minimal. These agreements were concluded in the 70s, 80s. Uh, do you agree with these critics? One of the ways in which these two elements uh, can be put together is by also using our bilateral uh, tools, our bilateral agreements, to enter into a dialogue with third countries and also to try to identify particular problems that they may actually face when it comes to, impl to complying with the European Union to autonomous uh, autonomous legislation. So from that point of view, our trade agreements provide an opportunity to engage also in the dialogue. Because one thing that we want very much to emphasize, the fact that we have adopted these autonomous uh, measures, which are necessary to fulfill the, our ob objectives in terms of sustainability, doesn't mean that we are not open to cooperate with our countries. And I think that we have tried to design 
those measures in a manner that they leave a lot of opportunities for cooperation and dialogue with third countries. And one of the places where we can actually engage in that dialogue is through our trade, trade, uh, through our trade, trade agreements. So from that point of view, there is a relationship between these autonomous actions and the new approach on TSD, trying to also identify how the trade agreement can help to facilitate uh, yes. compliance uh, with, uh, with our autonomous legislation. It occurs to me that these legal acts allow for a great level of flexibility. For instance, CBAM provides for the taking into consideration of existing CO2 markets or tax arrangements abroad. Yes, actually, and let me just perhaps emphasize that the flexibility in the design of CBAM is not just limited uh, to those countries that have introduced carbon pricing, uh, carbon taxes, uh, emission trading schemes because the way that uh, CBAN it is conceived, the degree to which you are subject to the carbon border measure depends on the actual intensity of your actual emissions. So if a country has chosen not to introduce uh, a carbon tax, but they have introduced regulations, and as a result of those regulations, producers from that country have low emissions, they will have to pay CBAN, uh, but they will do it at a much, at a much lower rate. Or if it is a case not of the regulations adopted by a country, but the practice of individual uh, companies, their investments, again, the way that CBAN it is conceived, it is always intended to ensure that there is a strict proportionality between what you pay and the amount of your emissions, and that this is non-discriminatory vis-a-vis the burden that we impose on European, uh, on European producers. Now, this being said, we know that there are, of course, a lot of questions about in practice, uh, how these measures are going to be implemented, how carbon embedded emissions are going to be measured, what steps you can take to help particularly those developing countries that may actually find it difficult to comply with the requirements. And all of those issues are issues that we can tackle through our dialogue with the countries concerned. And also that's the reason why we have actually decided that during the first two years of its application, CIVAM would not be actually be implemented. It would only be there to collect data. Mm -hmm. So that gives a lot of opportunity to use the time to, to help countries to be able to comply with the legislation. Nonetheless, many uh, critics um, uh, are taking the view that uh, these unilateral measures uh, can are actually lurking um, protectionist approach. Um, or other critics regarding the deforestation regulation uh, are claiming that it's going to impinge upon the sovereign rights of the states uh, to uh, exploit their natural resources. Um, how does the European Commission discard uh, or dismiss <coughs> these critics? Well, I think the fundamental element that we always uh, put forward is that we have designed uh, those uh, regulations in a manner which they are non-discriminatory in nature and that they are also very transparent in terms of the way that they are actually being, t being t applied. So I think that in a way these measures are there because we want to be sure that uh, the European Union can fulfill its high ambition commitments towards uh, net zero. I mean, it would make no sense uh, for the European Union to decarbonize uh, the steel sector, but then just simply to have production being shifted from Europe to elsewhere, so at the end of the day, carbon emissions would not decrease. We would, just, we would just simply see a shift of production from the European Union to other countries. But uh, we are conscious that we need to do it in a manner which in no case can be there to protect the interests of our domestic producers. And that's, by the way, for instance, in the case of CBAN, why one thing that we have been very, very clear vis-a-vis -vis our domestic industry is that as CBAN is progressively being introduced, the free allowances that they used to get when they uh, were subject to the European ETS, 
need to be eliminated. And there should be a parallelism between the elimination of free allowances and the progressive introduction of CBAM. If I understand you correctly, the EU places much emphasis upon unilateral measures as well on agreements concluded with third states. Does it mean that the EU is giving up on multilateralism? No, on the contrary. I mean, I, I referred in the beginning to, of this talk uh, about the trade policy strategy that we adopted uh, in the February of 2021. And in this document, we include a full annex with our policy about how the European Union wanted to see a strengthening and a reform of the World Trade Organization. Mm -hmm. And that's because we are convinced that precisely because we are living t in a time which is geopolitically much more turbulent, much more unstable, it is more important than ever to have a functioning multilateral trade institution. So that's the reason why the European Union has been very, very much in the forefront in promoting an agenda of WTO reform. I don't think I would be unmodest if I said that we play a leading role in making sure that last year when we had the 12 ministerial conference of the WTO, we could get a very substantive outcome. We had to be engaged in some very difficult discussions about a waiver on intellectual property. We pushed very hard to be sure there was an outcome on the fishery subsidies negotiations and that we actually had a very clear commitment towards uh, WTO reform. So from that point of view, I would say rather than saying that uh, in the current context, we are less committed to multilateralism, I would tend to make exactly the opposite argument, precisely because the current context is much more tense. We need, as a European Union, to, to take a little bit of a leadership role in cooperation with others, like Australia, which is, of course, very committed to, to the WTO as well, to make sure that the WTO can perform the functions or acting as a guardrail of stability in what is going to be a much more turbulent uh, trading uh, trade environment. <music>
By the way, it is something that has been discarded in the WTO, because in the WTO, there are plurilateral negotiations on an agreement on investment facilitation for development, in which more than a hundred WTO members are participating, including many African mm -hmm. members, and which are very, very close to being concluded. It will be actually the first time that an open plurilateral agreement could be concluded in the framework of the WTO. So in the case of uh, Angola, Angola indicated that they were quite keen to negotiate with the European Union an agreement that gave uh, a positive signal towards investment uh, investors, and that's why this investment facilitation agreement was negotiated with them, and we are exploring whether other countries in Africa might be interested in foreign esteem model. Of course, this is not an investment protection agreement. It does not have the afford uh, the investment core system. Now, that doesn't mean that we are no longer interested on potential negotiations of investment protection agreements, although in no case would it be with the traditional ISDAs, mm -hmm. because that's something that very clearly has no support in the European Union anymore. Could we then say that the EU's approaches to trade and investment are becoming more aligned? I mean, I'm not sure they were actually misaligned <laughs> in, the, in the past. I'm just trying to understand the, the implications of your, uh, of your question. To, but uh, one thing which is very clear is that investment protection agreements are quite challenging to negotiate uh, in the European Union because as you know, as a matter of legal competence, the moment that you include uh, an investor to state this few settlement system, this becomes mixed competence. Mixed competence meaning that for the agreements to come into place, they need to be ratified by all the member states. And that can take quite, quite a long, a long mm -hmm. time. I mean, I mentioned that we have concluded those type of agreements with uh, Canada, with Singapore, and with Vietnam, but none of those agreements have yet come into force because uh, the trade agreement is in force, but uh, this investment protection agreement, uh, which was separated from the trade agreement, needs to wait until it is ratified by all uh, the member states, and that can be quite, quite a lengthy process. So from that point of view, something like this investment facilitation for development agreements are a much more flexible to type of mechanism. And at the end of the day, it is probably more important also in terms of the signal that is being given to, to foreign investors about uh, the commitment of the country towards the transparency, investment environment, uh, the rule of law, sustainability standards, all of those elements are part of the investment facilitation agreement. Garcia Bercero, one final question. At the beginning of the interview, we talked about strategic autonomy, which implies a level of independence from external factors. We also talked during our interview a lot about cooperation, and we see that the EU aspires to be a leader in setting global standards for sustainability. Is there a level of inconsistency between these two objectives? Can the EU achieve both, or will it have to make a choice? Well, no, I don't think that there's an inconsistency, because at the end of the day, it is so clear that our preference is always to try to find, uh, whenever there's a challenge, a cooperative solution to with uh, third countries. Now, there may be, however, circumstances in which you have no other option than to act, and you always need to have your capacity to act autonomously, but you need to do it in a manner which is consistent with your international obligations. And that's why throughout all the different type of autonomous measures that we have been adopting, we have been very, very careful to ensure that uh, we take those measures in a manner which can be defended as being consistent with our international obligations, and we designed it in a manner that they keep options open for cooperation with the country concerned. So from that point of view, I don't think that open strategic autonomy is in contradiction with uh, our policy of engagement with third countries, both in a multilateral forum and bilateral. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Garcia Bercero, for providing your reflections upon the role played by your administration, the European Commissions, in combining 
sustainability with trade. Thank you. It was a pleasure to speak to you. Thank you. Thank you.